Coming up on today's Airborne, the AEA says worldwide avionics sales are up from 2012. Bombardier's C-Series nears its first test flight, and Laddie is on its way to the moon. Welcome to Airborne on Aero TV. I'm Ashley Hale. The avionics industry is on par to outperform sales from 2012, according to the second quarter avionics market report released by the Aircraft Electronics Association. In the months of April, May, and June of 2013, total worldwide avionics sales amounted to more than $1.6 billion, as reported by the 20 aviation electronics manufacturers participating in the report. However, the second quarter sales were down 5% from the first quarter 2013 sales. The dollar amount calculated using net sales price, not manufacturer's suggested retail price, includes all aircraft electronic sales, but the amount does not include repairs and overhauls, extended warranty, or subscription services. The AEA Avionics Market Report will continue to expand and provide greater detail in future reports. I expect that this report will eventually reveal the impact of such factors as the economy and how that affects our industry, seasonal trends, um, equipment mandates. That will have a big impact on the results of the report in the coming years. Again, our main mission is to provide a stable and clear look at the value and the size of the avionics market, something that has never been revealed or done before. This will benefit the entire aviation community. ANN is also preparing a more detailed report on this quarter's numbers for an upcoming program on Aero TV. Bombardier's new narrow-bodied C-Series aircraft could be seen in the skies for the first time very soon, now that high-speed taxi runs have been completed. The taxi test up to 120 knots were run last Friday. Bombardier released a video of the test runs in Mirabel, Quebec. Reuters reports that the completion of final ground test and weather remain the biggest factors in determining how soon the C-Series will take to the sky for its first test flight, a step that has already been delayed three times. Industry analysts will watch that flight to see if Bombardier's claims about the efficiency improvements on the C-Series prove true. Competitors will be watching the performance of the aircraft's new generation Pratt & Whitney engines. Bombardier claims the C-Series will be lighter and more efficient than others in its class, resulting in a savings on both cost and fuel. NASA is going back to the moon. Tom Patton tells us more about this latest mission. The Lunar Atmosphere and Dust Environment Explorer, or LADEE Observatory, launched aboard a Minotaur 5 rocket from the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport at NASA's Wallops Flight Facility in Virginia on Friday. LADEE is a robotic mission that will orbit the moon to gather detailed information about the lunar atmosphere, conditions near the surface, and environmental influences of lunar dust. A thorough understanding of these characteristics will address long-standing unknowns and help scientists understand other planetary bodies as well. LADEE is expected to arrive at the moon in 30 days, then enter lunar orbit, the mission is being managed by NASA's Ames Research Center at Moffett Field, California. For Airborne, I'm Tom Patton. An experimental Skycraft SD-1 Mini Sport has gone down in Spanish Forks, Utah, with the death of the test pilot Jay Leslie. The aircraft, the only one flying in the U.S. at the moment, was being run through some test flight protocols. Skycraft Director of Marketing Paul Glavin confirmed that the last flight, following two prior flights in which stalls and spins were reportedly examined, included some attempt at what were described as barrel rolls. Eyewitness Tyler Ives told media reps that, quote, The first roll went well, but the second roll was faster, and at that point the pilot appeared to lose control of the airplane, end quote. Leslie was 40 years old, a police sergeant, and a highly respected member of the local as well as the flying community. He was a certified flight instructor at the Spanish Fork-based Diamond Flight Center since March of 2009. The experimental Skycraft SD-1 Mini Sport drew heavy interest at the recent Air Venture 2013. The NTSB has tweeted that it's investigating the accident. On April 18, 1942, 
80 men achieved the unimaginable when they took off from an aircraft carrier on a top secret mission to bomb Japan. Led by Lieutenant Colonel James H. Jimmy Doolittle, these men came to be known as the Doolittle Tokyo Raiders. Today, just four of the men survive. In 1959, the city of Tucson, Arizona presented the Doolittle Raiders with a set of silver goblets, each bearing the name of one of the 80 men who flew the mission. At each of their past reunions, the surviving Raiders would conduct their solemn goblet ceremony. After toasting the Raiders who died since their last meeting, they would then turn the deceased men's goblets upside down. The intent was for the tradition to continue to the last man, but that is not to be. The U.S. Air Force will host the famed Doolittle Tokyo Raiders' final toast to their fallen comrades during an invitation-only ceremony on November 9th at the National Museum of the U.S. Air Force. The public will also have an opportunity to celebrate these World War II aviation heroes that day through events that include a wreath-laying ceremony and a flyover of B-25 aircraft. The United Master Executive Council of the Airline Pilots Association applauded United Airlines' announcement of the recall of all furloughed United pilots. In September 2008, United Airlines began laying off pilots, leading to a total of 1,437 pilots furloughed. Captain Jay Hepner, chairman of the United MEC, said, quote, We welcome our brother and sister pilots back with open arms. We've worked towards this day for more than five years. Now all United pilots together can meet the challenge of our future as we build the world's best airline, end quote. Training classes for the recalled United pilots are scheduled to begin next month and run through the end of the year. You're watching Airborne, more in a moment. Redbird Skyport is a multifaceted aviation laboratory charged with developing innovative solutions to the issues facing the industry. It started out as a vision for a laboratory where we could objectively measure the systems and the processes that we were developing. Being able to put some objective measures behind the anecdotal evidence that we have about the value of motion and the application of this technology is very, very important because until we can objectively measure it and play that data back, we can't design training systems that make the best use of it. For more information about Redbird Flight Simulations, as well as Redbird's new Skyport, visit www.redbirdflightsimulations.com or www.redbirdskyport.com. Welcome back. If you'd like to suggest a story for Airborne, Aero TV, our website, or our podcast, drop us an email to news-spy at aero-news.net. A New York teenager was fatally injured Thursday when the RC helicopter he was flying struck him, cutting off the top of his head. Roman Pirozak was pronounced dead at the scene by law enforcement officials. The 19-year-old had been vice president of Seaview Rotary Wings, a model helicopter flying club based in Brooklyn, and by all accounts was a model flying enthusiast. Pirozak was flying his model aircraft at Calvervo Park in Brooklyn, New York. The park is sanctioned by the city as a model aircraft field, as well as by the Academy of Model Aeronautics. Pirozak's father was with him at the time of the accident. The Virginia Seaplane Pilots Association will host a seaplane at Splash-In on Saturday, October 5th from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. at Lake Gaston Resort. This is an opportunity to watch seaplanes taking off and landing using water runways. The Virginia Department of Aviation, the Virginia Seaplane Pilots Association, Mecklenburg-Brunswick Regional Airport, and the National Seaplane Pilots Association are joining together for the event, which is free and open to the public. This will be the second gathering of the Virginia chapter of the Seaplane Pilots Association, which is the first state to establish its own association. A U.S. District Court judge in South Florida has dismissed a lawsuit alleging that the TSA lied on a Freedom of Information Act request. The suit was filed by John Corbett 
after he was denied access to his departure gate after refusing to submit to pre-flight screening at Fort Lauderdale Hollywood International Airport on August 27th of 2011. Corbett asked TSA for any and all records pertaining to the incident under the FOIA. TSA claimed no video of the incident existed, omitted names of personnel involved, and it said what video they did have was protected by privacy concerns because it showed the faces of some TSA employees. Federal Judge Joan Leonard determined that the agency acted properly in providing partial information under the FOIA. She dismissed the suit and closed the case. Corbett says the judge rubber-stamped the TSA's decision to supply only partial information and allowed TSA to lie under the FOIA when they said no video of the event existed. Corbett plans to make an appeal. Each week, we share with you a sample of an online video one of our viewers found especially entertaining. We call it our Aero Video of the Week. Ever wondered what it's like to lose power and have to make an emergency landing? Well, that's what happens in today's ABW. Watch as two young pilots have to put their training into action. By the way, there's nothing wrong with your computer. There is no audio in this track, it's a silent video. But the action speaks for itself. Search YouTube for cockpit footage captures moment light plane loses power. Seven general aviation organizations are asking the FAA to withdraw a proposed airworthiness directive affecting ECI cylinders used as aftermarket replacements on thousands of Continental Motors 520 and 550 engines. In a letter dated August 30th, the group asked the FAA to withdraw its notice of proposed rulemaking and provide an analysis justifying the proposed airworthiness directive. Alternatively, the letter asked the FAA to provide the information and then give pilots and in the industry an additional 120 days to respond. The associations say that while they share the agency's concerns for the safety of general aviation, without the agency providing supporting data used in drafting this proposal, they can neither fully understand nor evaluate the agency's safety concerns. Well, that's our program. Remember, you can get comprehensive, real-time, 24-7 coverage of the latest aviation and aerospace stories anytime at aero-news.net. And please join us again this Friday for a new edition of Airborne. I'm Ashley Hale. Thanks for watching.